Good morning. The reading this morning is in two parts. The first is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his way. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all of my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. And the second part is Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you, while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Very powerful words, aren't they? Isn't the word of God amazing? If you spend a day in those two psalms alone, I am sure that God would speak to you tremendously. Um, about many different things. There is so much, in, so much in there about God's character and about ours.
I um, prepared this for last week's sermon, actually, and, and uh, Francis had prepared the reading, but I had on the Saturday the, the, uh, the positive COVID test. And uh, it didn't end up getting used, so I thought, well, I better, uh, I, I thought, oh, I haven't asked. Someone else was on to do the reading. They got sick, and at the last minute I called Frances, but she said she loved those, uh, well, particularly Psalm 25 too, and Psalm 32, so. It's just great to just take time, and, and, and you know, I'm glad to have read that out, because I think we need to take time and ponder those words bit by bit, and in fact, we can't get through it all today, word by word, but if you, you know, it'd take about 10 sermons at least. Uh, you could do a whole series on just the, the words of 25 or 32 alone. But we start off in Psalm 25, if I could have the, the, uh, yep. Yeah. I want to, so the first thing I want to talk about is God's character. I want to talk about confession and I want to talk about our character. God's character. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. The, the, what the series that we've been doing is, is prayer that comes out of David's relationship with God. And you can see here in just those first words, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. David knows God to be a reliable God, a trustworthy God, a faithful God, one who gives him the confidence to put his trust in him, to put his whole life in his hands. How willing are we to put our whole life in God's hands? How well do we know God to put our whole life in his hands? David recognises that the ultimate victory, the protection, the deliverance, the justice, the love, are in God. God, his saviour, as he says in 6, 7 and 10. And, and, and one of the words, hesed, and I'm, I'm terrible on the pronunciation of the Hebrew, but that hesed, which you, you, you probably have heard about, or if you haven't, it's that, it's that gracious, the, uh, the kindness, the, the undeserved love, that... that that love, and, and that's the love that he's talked about here, uh, and, and uh, in the perpetual steadfast love. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, could we hear, hear the first part? Yeah. Yeah. You did it to Matt last week too, so you're not alone. <laughs> no, that was me. Had it on mute. <laughs> But I, apparently, even up the back, I wasn't on mute, so that's okay. good. I just needed to turn up my volume a bit. <laughs> no, the, the word of God is better heard and read. But that love, that in verse six, this is remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old of old. When we're looking at God's character. Right through this, we see God's mercy and his love for us. That, that word there, love, that's the hesed, that's the, that expression of kindness, the undeserved grace, the, the, the perpetual steadfast love. It's from of old, it's, it's ongoing, it's consistent, it's predictable. You can be sure of it, you know, it's that confidence that we have. It's that confidence that David has in the love of the Lord. And that mercy there, that, that's raham, um, that's, that's a word that, that in other places is used for womb and, and damsel and you, you almost have this sense that the mercy is the tender mercy of a mother. It's the tender loving mercy, the tender compassion of a mother. And, and you see here that, that, that David knows God in a way that is truly tender in, his, in God's care and truly loving and compassionate at, at, a, at a place where David knows that he is not deserving of any of it, but there is a God, a gracious, faithful God, faithful to his covenant, who has loved David. And for this, David can cry out and say, I want to give you everything on my heart. I want to acknowledge 
the, the sin in my life. I want to say, you are a great loving God and you haven't stopped being a tender loving God to me in, in, in everything that I've been through. And I just want to say thank you, God, and I realise that I have a great sin that has come between us and I have caused offence to a God who has continually loved me when I have done nothing of that to deserve that. Nothing to warrant. I'm not worthy of that love. And David recognises that. And this is the prayer. And, and you see, David's prayers are very messy. They're very heartfelt. They're very real. And you know why? Because God, David recognises that God already knows. David recognises that God knows what a mess he's in. David recognises that God knows how offensive he is how absolutely chaotic his life is, how self-destructive his life is, how his love toward God is nothing of what God's love is toward him. That's why. And when David confesses his sin, he wants to go in the way of God and he wants to walk in agreement of God. Yes, God, I, against you I have sinned. I agree. I am unworthy. But in you, I put my trust. And that word good that we see in verse 8, he doesn't withhold love. He doesn't withhold his generosity. He doesn't withhold his kindness. He is everything good, good for. Our good, good for. His glory. The upright, he is straightforward, he does what is right, he is fair, he is consistent, he is always right. We can trust in this measure of God that he is upright without fail. He is a God of integrity and righteousness. And when it mentions covenant in 10 and 14, I was reminded in Genesis where, where the animals were cut in half and in, in a covenant you would walk through together to say that if you broke the covenant, this would be the consequence. And, but in this one, in, in, with Abraham, God was the one who walked through. It was him alone who did the covenant because we know that only God will keep the covenant. Only God can be faithful to the covenant. And the, the covenant is reliant on his faithfulness. It's reliant on his love. It was, if it was reliant on us, we'd be in a mess. We'd be in a pickle. But that's the whole point that David recognises. It's not about me. It's about your covenant faithfulness. It's about your consistency. It's about this binding friendship of covenant that God has brought us into, that God will let, it, let us fall out once we give ourselves to him. He will look after us. He will hold us. That is the friendship that he has for us. He is dependable. He is trustworthy. He is predictable. He is a loyal friend. That is the covenant. It is that friendship which he has brought us into. And David recognises the absolute honour and privilege it is to be taken into that relationship. Do you see how David can then pray? My Lord, Lord, oh my God, my Saviour, my life stinks. Yeah, there's good. There's upright in our, our verse eight. There's a whole like there are a whole like you see six, seven, and ten. The love and the faithfulness of God. You just see all the way through the character of God, and you see that there lies there lies the the foundation for David's prayer. There lies the whole response that David can give because he can trust a God who's not letting, going to let him fall apart even when he's vulnerable and exposed and confesses openly his fragility. Remember, when we have things that are going on in our life, it is really tough. 
And it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to be raw. It's hard to be confessing, particularly to one another. But God, David recognises that God is a God who that even when he comes to in confession, he can rely on the love and mercy, the tender mercy that just wants to take David in his arms and say, it's okay, David. It's not reliant on your faithfulness. It's reliant on mine. And mine is steadfast. It's not reliant on your love. Your love fails every day. It's reliant on mine. And mine is steadfast, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And what a mighty love that is. And if there's anyone in this room that does not know the love of God, I can tell you, God loves you in a bit. He loves every ounce of you. He loves all of you. And he just wants you to know how much he loves you as a father. He doesn't stand there as judge. I can see God here. And he sits, stands as father wanting to embrace us like the, the prodigal son wanting us to run to him and him to us. You know, I love that the father, the prodigal father runs to his son. That's what David sees. He sees a God who is running to him in love. Don't let me be put to shame, it said in the, in the earlier verse, in, in, in 2, and it says toward the end, in, it says in 2 and 3, and in, chapter, in verse 20 of 25. Don't let me be put to shame. Don't let my poor character be exposed. Don't let my lack of faithfulness be exposed. Don't let my lack of... I'm a disloyal friend. I'm a, I'm a person who lacks integrity and righteousness. And, and, and don't, please, Lord, let me be facing this. Don't be declaring me guilty. I just want to be with you. And I want to stand right. And I want to honour you in your name. For the sake of your name. In, in 11, for the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. For your glory, for your honour and glory, you show your love. You show your faithfulness. You show your forgiveness you show your grace by your name your character your attributes no one who puts in their trust in you will be put to shame your good character your faithfulness your dependability forgive my iniquity Though it is great, he recognises the magnitude of what he has before him in God. The magnitude of what has been caused him to become, the dis what he is, the disloyal friend to God. That God is faithful and, it is, and David calls out his confession as we can today. He calls out his confession on the basis of who God is and his name and his character and, and everything that God stands for in the relationship, nothing of himself. And if you hear me repeat these things over and over again, it's because I want us to recognise, let's come to God and see God in all, who he is. Let's see ourselves in all, who we are, that we need him, and therefore the urgency for confession. The urgency to cry out from this relationship with God that says, I want nothing to be between us, God. And it's, it's, it's that wanting to be, you know, sometimes we just want to go, oh yeah, I want to just, you know, I want the forgiveness of God. I just, I just don't want to go to hell. You know, I just want the path to heaven. I just want to just, you know, I don't want to have to live a life or walk away. I want to just make, you know, just get the, just get the okay from God that everything's okay. But it's more than that, isn't it? God is wanting us to desire holiness, wanting us to desire righteousness, wanting us to desire the life of God. It is not just about forgiveness, it is about the cleansing and is it about our participation in the love of God and our response to that that comes automatically when God's love overwhelms us to the point where we say, I cannot stand before you guilty any longer. 
I need the love of Jesus, the blood of Jesus to make me clean. And I want to live a life of purity because it's not just one thing. Repentance is a lifestyle that goes on and on and on and says, I want the righteousness of Christ. I don't just want the pardon. I want the righteousness and holiness of God. I want to be part of that and I want to be with you, God. And the only way I can be with you is if you cleanse me by the blood of the Lamb. I want to be cleansed. And the problem is that even in Christian churches, we don't have the attitude, I want to be like God and pursue being like God, being with God, with God. And when you come into, into, con into contact with God, there is either two things that happen. And I'll get to them in a minute. But we don't want just, the, you know, the ID card. We want the new identity. We don't want just a step. We want to walk with God. We don't want to just be on the run from hell. We want to be on the run to our Father. You know, it's, it's awesome here. Get this, you know, you thought this was good. Oh, this is a humdinger for me. In the midst of... I always tried to live a perfect life in, when I was younger, and you, you've probably heard me, you know, I'm a, con, a converted Pharisee, I'd say. But the legalism that I, I and it isolated me, and you probably heard, I don't know if you heard in my testimony, that I had some very lonely times. We came up from New South Wales to Queensland, and there were some very lonely times. And what got me, <laughs> what got me was the friendship of God. The friendship with God. And if you have a look in, if you have a look in 14, the Lord confides in those who fear him. Do you know when you want to share something secret, something personal, and you don't want everyone to know? And, and how you have to go to someone who is intimate and who, who you just value and, and you just want to, you want them to have your trust? Do you know God shares his secret? We're entrusted with the secret things of God in 1 Corinthians. The Lord confides in those who fear him when we give our life to Jesus, when we believe in him, when we fear him. He wants to share the things that are important to him, the things that are personal and intimate and valuable. He wants to share them with you. He wants to share them with me. I think we undervalue the relationship with God, each and every one of us. And I think David recognises the intimacy with God and the value that he places on pursuing God so that he is recognised as a man after God's own heart. Not because he didn't sin. No, David, David really, <laughs> he did the, the, the absolute whammies of sin. And, and his life was falling apart, even his family. But it was because he knew that there is a great God and he is not great and he relies on the Lord's unfailing love. So we jump to 32. And I said to you, when we come into the presence of God, there's a response. That if we conceal our sin and the sin that David talks about here, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. When we have unconcealed sin, when we have sin before God, yes, sometimes our sickness is related to unconfessed sin. Sometimes the weight of what we do is related to, to sin. But there is a conviction of the Holy Spirit where God puts his hand down upon, where if we have sin in our life, when we come into the presence of God, there is a real oppression as God is wanting to say, you have sin. The weight that is upon, know that you, there is something not right. Know, and God has many ways of exposing what is not right in us. And it is not a pleasant thing when we come into the presence of God if we have something against him. Like David did, he came and he recognised that before, before a pure God, he was impure. His iniquity was great. When we come into God, he wants us to get rid of it. 
we'll see the contrast with the oppression in verse 4 that your hand was heavy on me to verse 7. You are my hiding place to be the place of security and safety and protection and light and hope and rejoicing where David wants to be rejoicing. One minute he's wanting to get away. I'm, I'm, I, I realise in, in the heaviness of my sin, I need to flee. But when I am right with you, I can run back in to that hiding place, that friendship that is totally loyal, the friendship that is totally faithful, the one that I can trust. He's not going to break it, break it ruin my confidence. He wants us to let go of all that hinders, let go of all that oppresses our life, and to run to him as a security, as a safety, as a place of love, and a place of real refuge and hope and joy. Do you see do you see this interplay of David and God throughout these? And, and I hope you don't mind me just using the two passages, but I think um, I, I could have used 51 for confession, but I thought it's, it's sometimes we do that one a bit, you know, creating me a clean heart, that we do uh, a bit too much on that, that we can sometimes, you know, we almost rattle it off. But there's always this... This, this interplay between God's deliverance as we see in, in Psalm 25 and, and the alluding to the sin to in 32 where it is is totally this, this wrestle that David has and we don't not quite sure when this fits but we know that whatever it is David is recognising and I see think that we just see the heart here of David in saying I cannot have anything to do with sin, I need it out of my life. It is you know, the physical impact are great for David. And in 25, 25 5, he said, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is all in you all day long. God wants to get in the way of God. God wants to be in... Uh, David wants to get in the way of God. David wants to be in the hiding place of God. He wants to be in that relationship with God. He says, you guide me. You teach me. You show me your ways, O Lord, in verse 4. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. You are the one who can show me what's good for my life. You can show me what's good for your glory. You can show me what's good for the world. And in fact, at the end of verse... At the end of chapter 25, uh, at the end of each of them, there is this, um, in, in verse 22 of 25, deliver Israel, O oh God, from all their troubles. And, and in 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. There is this uh, connection with the community. There is this connection with with. God's ways are good for me. God's ways are good for his glory. God's ways are good for his church. God's ways are good for the whole community. And David wants to be a part of that. I'm here to soak it up, God. I want to soak it up. In 32.8, I will instruct you and teach you. This is David speaking as, as of God speaking. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. That loving eye, the, the master and servant, the interplay, the, the, the things that are not said when you have an intimate relationship, the, the perpetual care of a parent or the, the, the perpetual interaction of a friend that goes deeper than even words could express at times. The unutterable. He wants God's teaching. He wants to follow God's path. He he. But he says, "Don't go about it the hard way." And I've got to say, in the last few weeks. I feel like I've been like the horse or the mule who have no understanding but must be contr controlled by bit and bridle. That there's things that I've been resisting and God's gone, whoa, Byron, do it the hard way. I gave you opportunity to let go. You didn't. So now I've got to, you know. 
I've got to do it the hard way, by bitten by bridle. Do you ever feel like that you, God has to go about it the hard way with you? Might have to, you know, do a bit more of intervention, a bit more saying, hello, you're going on the wrong track. Pressed, you know. Whoa, come on, come on, come on. See, God wants us, and David recognises this. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. I want it to be in a relational way. I don't want to have to show you the hard way. But you know, it's not what we've done in sin. But it's about what we do with God. It's about who we are with God. It's about how we let Him change us. It's about giving our life to Him and trusting Him with our life so that He can change us. Being in that place of availability so that the transformation can happen. It's not just confession, it's repentance, it's that life with God. We, he desires us to seek truth, as in, as in verse 5 of 25, that we, like David, would seek truth, that we, like David, would seek righteousness. And it's about the posture we take before God. It's about the, the predisposition. It's about the attitude. It's about the, the whole demeanour of where we want to head with God. Because we will, some, we're a, a fragile being, we will fall, but he wants us to be in the humanity that he created us to be, to be pure and in relationship with him. And it's about our, our desire to be predisposed that way, to be our attitude to be that way, to be that way inclined, not inclined as a slave to sin, as a slave to the enemy, as our slave to our own lusts and desires. He wants us to be inclined into his purity and righteousness and to know everything wonderful about our Lord and Saviour and his character that we're reminded of, the loving faithfulness, the steadfast love that never changes, even when we don't feel it. Even when we don't know it. But seek God in his truth. Seek God in his righteousness. Seek God and, and every, all those things will be added unto you. It's about humility and obedience. And these are the humility, verse 9. Obedience, verse 10 of 25. God leads, teaches, instructs ways that are loving and faithful. He imparts that to us. He wants it to become part of our life. That we fear the Lord in verse 12. That we have that respect, that awe of God. That we have a repentant heart. As David says in 51, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken, contrite heart. He wants us to be soft in his hands. He doesn't want us to be hard. He wants us to know his love and know that we don't have that love. And no matter how much love we think we've got, we've only just started to get the touch of God's love and the magnitude of God's love. And he wants us to be overwhelmed and rush into that hiding place where we can be so totally secured away from the world and be protected to know the joy of the Lord and you know what to know no anxiety to know no depression to know no misery to know no suffering that's the place that he wants that's heaven that's an eternity with our Lord and God that's what he wants and David's going we've only just begun and when we give our sin to him and allow our lives to be humble and surrender in you oh Lord I put my trust I put my life oh my soul blessed is the one happy is the one joyful is the one excited is the one whose sins are forgiven <coughs> The transgression is forgiven. The sin is covered. 
in whom the Lord counts no iniquity, that these aren't counted towards us. We have a life that is counted as innocent, and that's what we want to be seen as. We want to be seen as innocent before our God. We want to see like we haven't been the friend who has backstabbed our God. It's about recognising God's character and love, our deficiency, our deficiency and our faithlessness, and trusting in him. In Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Seek wisdom, as in these passages. Seek truth, seek righteousness, confess sin, ask for pardon, acknowledge the character of God, and be teachable and walk in his ways. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we see a heart that was always pursuing you, a heart after your own heart. Lord, all that matters in this life is that, that we are with you. All that matters in this life is what we say about you, what we know about you, what we live for you. And Lord, we get caught up in the running of this world and we get caught up in the running of our lives we get caught up in how we're going to manage family and work and, and, and pleasure and pain. and Lord, there are so many things that we just get caught up in. And we have one faithful friend who is the same yesterday, today and forever, who is always faithful, whose steadfast love never ceases, never changes. And Lord, we need to run to you, knowing that you're the only security in the whole of this world. <coughs> the hiding place, the rock, the shield, the refuge, the only place that's safe in this world. The only place that is good. The only place of true love. The only place of true healing. The only place of true deliverance, of true confession, of true, true freedom in life with a Heavenly Father. Lord, renew our focus. Renew our attention. Renew our passion, renew our love, renew our seeking, renew our lives for you in your name.